Uh, so on with the first session, uh, the general title of the session is through the road blocks, uh, which is the same title as the overall project. Uh, we're going to have a, a, a keynote paper and then we're going to have three more papers. Um, the first paper is going to be about uh, 14 minutes for five, enough, okay? And it's going to be like 10 or 15 minutes of questions. And then we'll have three more papers, 20 minutes each. And again, for each paper, right at the end of each paper, we're going to have like 10 minutes of questions and answers. Okay. Uh, so first up is uh, Mr. Horvath sitting next to me, uh, who's the, uh, he's a Croatian, uh, uh, actually he's from Croatia, he's a philosopher and activist, and he's the director of the Subversive Forum, an annual conference with an activist meeting held traditionally every May in Zagreb, uh, to where he brings more subversive people to talk, you know, like the people who are sitting here in the audience. Uh, and, um, He's going to talk all about Nazi, Nazis on the moon, so it should be interesting. <laughs> you. So, hello everyone. I'm not really going to speak about Nazis on the moon, but mainly on the Nazis on the earth. Uh, but first of all, I would like to thank and congratulate uh, Elen, uh, Yanis, Adonis, uh, Nicolas, Maria, uh, George, Alexander, and all others who were involved in this uh, important event. Uh, since for the last few years, I have also been involved uh, in through the roadblocks. I know how many problems they had, mainly of financial nature, of course. Uh, but in spite of that, they managed to break through all these roadblocks, and finally we are here on Cyprus. Uh, so first of all, I would like to really thank mainly Ellen for being here. Uh, I think Cyprus uh, is the best place to speak about road roadblocks, uh, however we, we might understand them. Social roadblocks, economical roadblocks, political roadblocks or cultural roadblocks, real roadblocks or imaginary roadblocks. Uh, as you all know, uh, Cyprus is, as Diana Spivak mentioned yesterday, the current presidency holder of the Council of the European Union. Uh, this is on the one hand. On the other hand, it is still a divided uh, country. Uh, just yesterday, uh, Tariq and me, we were in Nicosia, and then we had a trip uh, to Famagusta uh, to see the still uh, occupied uh, city Varosha. And on the third hand, uh, last but not least, uh, when I was coming here, one of my German friends uh, asked me whether I'm coming to Cyprus to save my savings. So as you know, on the third hand, Cyprus is, of course, an offshore bank in heaven, which faces now huge problems. Uh, so in the same island, uh, you have all topics I will try to tackle today in my lecture. On the one hand, you have this positive image of European Union represented by the Council of, uh, by the presidency holder of the Council of the European Union. On the other hand, uh, you have uh, a still divided uh, country, you have nationalist tendencies, you have borders, you have roadblocks and so on. And on the, first, on the, on the third hand, last but not least, you have the financial, uh, financial basis of this uh, trio. Uh, I will start uh, with an anecdote. Recently, when I was in Bucharest uh, at a conference called uh, the National Question in Central Eastern Europe, I was uh, driving the elevator to the conference rooms uh, in the hotel, and there I found a very interesting map. It was a map of Europe, uh, but uh, it wasn't a real map of Europe. It was actually a map of the rooms, of the seminar rooms in the hotel. And I was really surprised to find out uh, that all the seminar rooms uh, had the names of uh, European cities. Uh, so you had a Berlin room, you had an Amsterdam room, you had a Paris room, uh, and so on and so on. Uh, is there a better imagination of the solved national question in the European Union than this map? All countries can live beside each other happily without any conflicts and so on. And actually when I was there at one seminar room, we had an academic series, let's say, so conference. At the other room there was a wedding party. Uh, we can imagine that another room in, in room Berlin there was uh, a promotion of a commercial product and we can imagine that in the room Amsterdam there was some focus group going on. So you had, you had it all in just one hotel and you even, you even didn't need to, to leave the hotel. Uh, this reminded me of another strange example and that's the reason why behind me you can see the, the picture of Costa Concordia. Uh, it is, of course, seen from the moon, we can understand it like that, and this is the relation uh, toward the, the, the title of my lecture, Are the Nazis Living on the Moon? So they are looking at Costa Concordia, 
as you will see, I think Costa Concordia is the best metaphor of uh, the European Union today. Uh, so as you probably all know, Costa Concordia is the famous cruise ship uh, that hit uh, the rock in the Tyrrhenian Sea in January 2012. Uh, but what is even more interesting, and here we come to the interesting details, the Concordia means harmony and unity. And this name of the ship uh, intended uh, to be a metaphor of the European, of the successful project of the European Union. But if you go a step further, then we find out uh, that all the decks of Costa Concordia, and this is the relation to the anecdote which we like, started, all the decks of Costa Concordia had the name of uh, European countries. The first deck was called Poland. I don't know if it is because of the Holocaust and they were trying to show some respect or whatever. Uh, the other was called Austria. Uh, the other floors were, were called Spain, Portugal, and so on. And similar to the seminar room, uh, to the seminar rooms in the Romanian hotel, at the middle of the boat, you can find it on the internet. There was some central square called Atrium Europe, and you had a bar called London Bar. You had a disco called uh, a Disco Lisbon. You had a casino called Disco Ber uh, Casino Berlin, and so on and so on. So again, you had you have a, you have seminar rooms in the Romanian hotel, and you have Costa Concordia with the same pattern. And here, to even go a step further, because before I come to more serious stuff, uh, I'm, it is not possible to resist the temptation to point out the fact that Costa Concordia, the same ship, uh, served uh, as a setting for the last film by Jean-Luc Godard, Socialism. Uh, so Jean-Luc Jean Godard didn't take uh, a warship or a speedboat, but he took exactly this boat you can see here, a slow, luxurious, cruise ship as a symbol of today's Europe. For example, on the ship you have the famous French philosopher Alain Badiou uh, holding a lecture in front of a completely empty hall. You have the famous singer and uh, artist and poet Patti Smith wandering around with a guitar, but no one really cares. So again, if you put together the decks of Costa Concordia and the film by Jean-Luc Godard, you came to the current situation of the European Union. Uh, what is even more interesting, how did the accident of Costa Concordia happen? It happened so that the captain of the ship was seen the night before the accident drinking very expensive wine with a beautiful woman, and the next day he escaped, uh, he escaped the ship, uh, leaving all the passengers on the ship. So my question is, isn't this exactly the same as the European <laughs> elites in Europe today who are drinking fine wine and with a beautiful woman and so on and escape the ship before all the people who are on the ship, all the passengers and that, that are we? On the one hand, to get to more serious stuff, uh, the European Central Bank, as they like to, to, to call it in the financial discourse, released uh, more than 1,000 billion euros uh, from, the, from 2011. I don't know if you can imagine this sum, 1,000 billion euros. Again, not to save uh, the people, but to save the banks. Something similar is now happening in Cyprus, as I read in Spiegel last week, where they tried to save the, the Cypriot banks uh, with public money, again, to actually save the money of Russian oligarchs who have the, uh, the money on, the, on their offshore accounts. On the other hand, we bear witness a continuing shock therapy, austerity measures, structural adjustments in all European countries, from Greece and Portugal, from Spain to Italy, but also including some Eastern European countries like Slovenia or Croatia. And as you probably know, all these technocrat elites have one thing in common. Most of them were working for one humanitarian organization called the Goldman Sachs. <laughs> it's Mario Monti, Mario Draghi, and Lucas Papademos, just to name a few of them. And actually, the last one is again the best example of what is wrong with Europe today. If you play with the term etymology uh, of Lucas Papademos, you came to a strange, to a strange, uh, uh, let's say, some metaphor of Europe again. Uh, Papademos can mean the father of the people, Papademos, but again, it can mean Papa Demos, which means goodbye to the people. So I think this is the best uh, description of Europe today. But if we, if we go a step further, in, if we understand uh, the father of the people and goodbye to the people as a thesis and a synthesis, I'm using the dialectics again in colloquial, not philosophical uh, sense, uh, then we come uh, neither more nor less than to the mythology of Saturn, who is eating all its children except Jupiter. 
I hope you remember the story from mythology, be it Ro Ro Roma mythology or Greek mythology, because Papa in Croatian and in Slovenian, in Slavic languages, means eating again. It, Papa means eating. So at the same time, you have a father who is eating all his children. So I think, although Papa Demos is not so important in Greece anymore, I think Samaris and all others are also eating their people, and especially the people from the Goldman Sachs who are in rule in, in Europe today and the Troika. Uh, one of the consequences of this radical neoliberal turn, and here I slowly get to the title of my lecture, is the, is the rise of extreme right and nationalism, who are more and more mobilizing the working class. It's not by chance that the name of the most extreme right-wing party in Czech Republic is Workers' Party, so in the name they already have uh, a reference to the workers, and they are infamous for pogroms of Roma people. Uh, is it not? It, it's not a surprise, uh, the, the biggest surprise of the last Greek elections wasn't <coughs> just Syriza, but the Golden Doll. There were previously a marginal fascist group beating up immigrants and blaming immigrants for the crisis in Greece, but now they are, like many others in Europe today, in Holland and so on, uh, a legitimate and legal group in the parliament. Uh, here is a typical illustration of this rhetoric, uh, quote, I quote, one has taken all sovereign rights from us. We are just good enough that international capital allows us to fill its money sacks with interest payments. Three million people lack work and sustenance. The official, it is true, work to conceal the misery. They speak of measures and silver linings. Things are getting steadily better for them and steadily worse for us. The illusion of freedom, peace and prosperity that we were promised when we wanted to take our faith in our have own hands is vanishing. Only complete collapse of our people can follow from these irresponsible policies. Isn't this a perfect description of the current deadlock in the European Union? And this is not a rhetorical question. Uh, who is the author of this text? Would you say it's Syriza or the Golden Dawn? Maybe Nicolas can answer. <laughs> yeah, if you have an answer. <laughs> Most probably it's Golden Dawn because Syriza is not really honest, it's a social democrat kind of party. So we couldn't be against calling the European Union in this way. So not what is Golden Dawn. It's it's still wrong. <laughs> but we can discuss it, it's not Syriza, but we can discuss Syriza later, I hope. Uh, actually the author is no one else than Joseph Goebbels. And it's, which your thesis was correct, actually, because this is the, the, the analogy I want to make. It is, it is a text that Joseph Goebbels published, Goebbels published in 1927 under the title Via Foda, We Demand, in a journal called Andrif, uh, which was then at this time still a marginal journal. The circulation of the journal was only 2,000 copies. Uh, later, already in 1933, the circulation of the journal is 150,000, and in 1944 you have the circulation of 300,000 copies sold. So as you can see, first you have a marginal uh, journal where Go Goebbels is using the discourse, which is very similar, as you correctly said, to Golden Dawn, but only in 10 or 15 years the circulation is rising <coughs> and it turns into the official newspaper of the Nazi uh, Socialist uh, Party. Uh, so what I want to say is that uh, also today we have a similar situation. A party like the Golden Dawn first seemed like a marginal party, no one took really care, but after the financial crisis uh, they are now one of the, let's say, uh, most dangerous party in Greece, but also dangerous for Europe at the same time. Regardless of all political and economical parallels between the financial crisis 2008 and the crisis 1929, uh, we have, of course, to be careful when comparing the present-day situation to the historical moment when Nazis came to power. Nevertheless, dismissing the fact that hand in hand, hand with the current financial crisis, the right camp again uses the national question in order to divert the attention of people from the real political, social, economical, economical situation might be dangerous as well. And recently, in a German, uh, German newspaper called Handelsblatt, Antonis Samaras compared actually the situation of today's Greece uh, with the Weimar Republic. Of course, he was denouncing not only the Golden Dawn but also the Syriza, but exactly he and his friends from the Troika are the, the, the reason of this national suppression, let's say so. 
And here we come, and this is also, here we will explain the title of the lecture uh, finally. Here we come uh, to a comic science fiction film called Iron Sky, uh, which was in cinemas this year, 2012, uh, and uh, it can give us, I, I claim, an unexpected lesson. So it tells a story of uh, the defeat of Nazis in 1945, but instead of a real defeat, the Nazis go to the moon, and they wait. They, they, they build a basis on the moon, they build a space fleet on the moon, and they have an intention to invade the Earth in 2018. <coughs> what then happens is two of the Nazis go to the Earth to prepare the terrain for the final solution or for the anschluss between moon and Earth, and no one really believes them. They're walking around as marginals, lunatics, like the Golden Doll did, or like Goebbels did, and no one really believes them, and all of them make fun of them. But then at one point uh, of time, a PR manager of uh, a politician who is going to be uh, part of the elections, uh, a party of Sarah Palin, notices the potential of the Nazis, and she uses them in, in their PR. Uh, of course, uh, when it is too late, uh, they discover that the Nazis are really Nazis and the Nazis actually conquer the earth. So, we will show a very short uh, trail of the film and then we will continue it. It's, yeah. Yeah. Moments ago, New York has, has come under attack. Witnesses claim to have seen hundreds of UFOs. that something similar is happening today in Europe. Uh, in the late 1920s, the gas chambers and all atrocities made by the Nazis also seemed like a science fiction scenarios to the most of the people, except some who were warning of Hitler and so on. Uh, but if the analogy between Goebbels discourse and this movie seems a bit exaggerated, I will point out and finally come also to some art uh, to a recent art experiment uh, which uh, happened in Serbia, I think it was April 2012. Uh, so two young unemployed Serbian playwrights uh, made an, let's say, experiment because they, was, they were unemployed, like the most of the people, young people in, in Europe are today. And uh, they tried to show that it is possible to join all the political parties in Serbia. What they did? What did they do? In April uh, 2012, uh, they sent a policy proposal for culture policies in Serbia under the title Idea Strategy Movement. 
and their text and their vision was very well accepted by all Serbian parties. Uh, one Serbian party even published it uh, on its website. We don't have time to show the experiment, but on the internet you can find a YouTube of the Serbian playwrights showing how they actually, what, what, what they made with the text. What they did was very simple. They actually used one of Goebbels' texts under the title Knowledge and Propaganda, not from the year 1927, which I quoted, but from the year 1928, just one year later. And then just, they just changed two or three sentences, uh, naming uh, Serbian politicians and so on. And what happened in the end actually was that all Serbian parties accepted the text. Of course, this is still not the proof that the Nazis are coming back to the Earth, but it is, it is symptomatic and I, should, I, I think it should warn us. Uh, at the same time, when this happened in Serbia, a uh, Croatian nationalist uh, tried to organize an international nationalist meeting in Croatia. Of course, it sounds uh, very strange. They, they, they called uh, other nationalists uh, and they were internationalists, so it's a bit strange. You have nationalist, internationalist, or, na or internationalist, nationalist. And among others, uh, invited parties were the. In, in the end, we succeeded to stop them, and the prime minister and president condemned the meeting. But the parties who were invited uh, were the National Democratic Party from Germany. Uh, connected to the recent uh, neo-Nazi murders in Germany. Uh, then the National Front from France, infamous for neglecting the Holocaust. And last but not least, this is the most interesting example, the Hungarian party called Jobbik, which is a parliamentary party, and which is probably the most bizarre component of the story. Namely, this party tries to come up with a revision of the Trianon Treaty from 1920, when Hungary lost one of the part of its territories, which is now Croatia. So you have actually the situation that Croatian nationalists are inviting Hungarian nationalists who want a part of the Croatian territory. Uh, but it would be wrong only to laugh at these uh, far-right absurdities. What was the first thing the Austrian politician Hans Christian Strache, infamous for the, for the slogans during the election campaign, 2010 in Austria, uh, like Mea Mut für unser Wiener Blut, or the Fremdes tut niemandem gut, did after he won, I think it was, our colleague from Austria can correct it, 26 or 27 percent uh, at the elections, which, is, uh, which was really a surprise, but because until then uh, Vienna was regarded as a red city. What was the first thing he did after this election? Together with other extremists from Europe, uh, he went to a team building uh, to Israel. And this is still not all. Uh, in Israel, they published uh, a manifest called uh, the Jerusalem, uh, the Jerusalem Manifest or the Jerusalem Declaration, uh, which claims uh, that Israel has the right to exist and defend itself again against Islamic terrorism. So here, here you have it again. I think it was a perfect two years ago, perfect anticipation of the events which are happening now, only two or three hours away from Cyprus. What is even more interesting uh, is that the strongest allies Strache had in Vienna was the growing Serbian immigrant community. And in order to get rid of the unwanted immigrants, the Turks, the Muslims, and all the others who are there, the Africans and so on, uh, they just created good immigrants, and those were the Serbs. And this is still not all. You probably all remember the case of Anders Breivik in Norway. And you know who was one of the, mo one of the biggest heroes of Anders Breivik? It was Radovan Karadzic, the Serbian war criminal. I quote, and I suggest you to read this bizarre manifesto by Breivik. You can find it as well on the internet. It's called 2083, again we come to the future, a European Declaration of Independence. And there Breivik says the following. I do condemn any atrocities committed against Croats and vice versa, but for his efforts to cure Serbia of Islam, he will always be Radovan Karadzic, considered and remembered as an honorable crusader and a European war hero. So what happens today is a new kind of extreme right that doesn't hesitate to use all possible means in order to build a stronger movement. On the one hand, as we can see with the Workers' Party in Czech Republic, uh, they are using workers' rights to, to gain power. It's the same in Greece with the Golden Dawn. On the other hand, they are doing coalitions with other extreme parties as it happened in, in Croatia. 
but instead of uh, easily dismissing these absurd coalitions, I think here we should remind ourselves of Walter Benjamin, uh, who said every fascism bears witness to a failed revolution. As you can see, the ongoing financial crisis uh, and imposed austerity measures is a fertile ground not only for a new accumulation of capital by the financial elites uh, mentioned previously, but also for the rise of new nationalism. Using workers' rights as the main weapon is not only the mean of the left anymore, but the difference between the right and between the left is nevertheless clear. The right is turning one working class against the other, the Germans against the Greeks in Austria, the Serbians against the Muslim minority and so on, and uses the workers' discourse mainly to finally grab the power. But the former marginal and extreme groups are now turning into not only legitimate but also legal parties. The Golden Dawn in Greece is not only the exception anymore, but the rule. And my thesis is the Nazis, who finally answered the question, don't have to hide on the moon. Uh, they can undisturbed and calmly live on the earth already. And since all the time we are speaking about the prospects of a new war, it is uh, impossible not to mention the Nobel Peace Prize uh, for Europe, uh, and especially in regard to a country where I come from, which is Croatia. Uh, because uh, the official explanation of the Nobel Peace Prize referred to it directly uh, to, the, to the Balkans region. If you have read the official explanation for the Nobel Peace Prize, you could have read the following. I quote, uh, the EU was awarded because it contributed to the advancement of peace and reconcil reconciliation, democracy and human rights in Europe. And exactly this myth was repeated in the official press release by the Norwegian Selection Committee. Another quote, the admission of Croatia as a member next year, as you probably all know, Croatia will become the newest and maybe the last member state next year. The opening of membership negotiations, negotiations with Montenegro and the granting of candidate status to Serbia all strengthen the process of reconciliation in Balkans. But here we face the first problem. It was exactly the EU who didn't stop massacres like Srebrenica, which happened in Bosnia during the war. And, of course, it is the EU which has several new wars coming up, or they are happening right now, just a few hours out of Cyprus. Of course, it is not difficult to dispute the Nobel Peace Prize. As Tarek mentioned yesterday, uh, there is a story that in 1936, uh, the, the Norwegian committee, selection committee actually was deciding either to give the prize to Hitler or to give the prize to Gandhi. In the end, no one of them got the prize. I hope uh, Tarek in his lecture in two days will, uh, no, tomorrow, will we'll talk more about that. And actually, since Henry Kissinger uh, what the Nobel Prize, it was clear that Orwell's famous trade of war is peace could be the best description of the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, last year it was Obama, of course, who didn't withdraw the troops from Afghanistan or Iraq, and so on and so on. As Tariq Ali mentioned in one of his interviews, one of the preconditions to join the EU today is to be part of the NATO. This situation happened in the Balkans. Croatia first had to join the NATO in order to join the EU. And as we know, NATO has troops also in the mentioned countries. And actually now, as we speak, uh, Europe is deciding to send troops to Mali. Uh, and next week, I think the United, States, uh, United Nations will decide if the troops will come to Mali uh, because of Islamic fundamentalism. And the, explanations, the explanation is, again, very interesting. They claim that Mali is now a threat to European democracy, which is very interesting. Actually, I had the chance to be in Mali last year, in Timbuktu, which is now impossible to come, and I didn't, I wasn't kidnapped, kidnapped as they say, because I'm here. Uh, I, I didn't see any Islamic fundamentalists and so on. It is again the same old story as it happened in Iran before the intervention of the CIA and, and the intervention of the West. It was a democratic country, a secular country. It was the same with Iraq, it was the same with Afghanistan. And I think the pattern is now repeating in Mali where again with an intervention they will actually create more Islamist, Islamistic fundamental than, than it was before. And to mention Cyprus finally. So the European Union is giving the Nobel Peace Prize 
the, 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 Nobel, the Norwegian selection committee is giving the Nobel Peace Prize to Europe, but at the same time we are here now in a country which is still divided, which has borders and where a sort of war is still going on. On the other hand, which is now uh, an irony, uh, the Nobel Peace Prize just in a few days, I think in two weeks or three weeks, will be given in a country which on the referendum twice refused the membership in the European Union, which is Norway, of course. So what we have in Europe isn't really peace, but exactly the opposite. Not only involvement, involvement in different wars, but also permanent economic warfare in the way of peace. Is there any better proof than the submarine deals that helped sink Greece? The billions spent on German U-boats, while the EU is pushing, pushing for more cuts in education and healthcare system and so on. Uh, it was last, last week, I think, in Frankfurt der Allgemeine Zeitung that I read a real short news, as it always is, uh, that uh, I will come back to this news. Actually, in Frankfurt, Frankfurt der Allgemeine Zeitung, two weeks ago, I read another short news. On the one hand, you had a big interview. Uh, probably those uh, who follow the situation in Europe are following, uh, are, know about that. There was a big interview by Manuel Barroso, who was claiming we need more Europe. But there was a very small news about Romania. They still don't give the green light for Romania to join the Schengen zone because Romania is corrupted. I will come back to this question. What I wanted to say is actually that just a few days ago I read the news uh, that malaria is back to Greece uh, because of the breakdown of the healthcare system. So here you have it really, Greece is becoming a third world country as we speak. And for me, it's impossible in the end, I will end very soon, uh, not to mention the country where I come from, which is Croatia. It was one, once part of a country named Yugoslavia, but next year, in June, it will become part of the European Union. But Croatia is not joining the center of the European Union, exactly the opposite. It will be part of the gypsies, as they call now. They have the pigs or the, or, or the gypsy. It will be a country of the periphery. Uh, the, statistics, the statistics show that Croatia is actually on the third place when it comes to unemployment among young people. The first, of course, are Greece and Spain with more than 50%. Uh, Croatia is the third with more than 40%. Uh, more than 90% of banks in Croatia are foreign banks. Uh, most of the uh, Yugoslav Yugoslavian uh, firms, which were, which were once state firms, are now privatized. Uh, telecommunications, uh, as I said, there is only one bank which is still Croatian, which is the Croatian Postal Bank. Something similar now is happening in Greece also with the Postal Bank. Uh, something similar what is happening in Greece is now happening in Croatia. Uh, they are preparing the terrain for privatizing the railway system. We all know what happened in Britain during Margaret, after Margaret Thatcher actually. What they intend to do now is also the gradual privatization of the energy sector privatization of the healthcare, uh, healthcare system, privatization of the education system. So actually, with the European Union, all these trends will just, uh, just move forward. Uh, so to conclude this pessim pessimistic overview bit uh, of Europe, I will end with a joke. And to warn you, it is not an optimistic joke. <laughs> you probably remember the joke, it is a well-known joke uh, about a patient who comes to a doctor and it is the famous the good and bad news joke. Uh, so the patient comes to the doctor and says, okay doctor, I feel ill and so on. And the doctor says, yeah, after investigating your body and so on, uh, I have one bad news and one good news. The bad news is you have cancer says the doctor, but the good news is since you, when you come home you will forget about it because you have Alzheimer. <laughs> <laughs> and isn't this, uh, isn't this, couldn't this joke be, uh, be uh, a good description also for the entrance of Croatia uh, to the EU? Uh, the bad news is of course Croatia is, in a, as I said, in a big economical, uh, economical crisis, in a big political crisis, in a big moral crisis, and so on and so on, corruption affairs erupting everywhere. But the good news is, of course, Croatia is joining the European Union. <laughs> on the one hand, just last week, uh, we had, uh, and this is the country where I come from, 
the previous Prime Minister, who was once uh, the most popular person not only in Croatia but also in, in, in Europe. He spoke very fluently German, he went to Bals, to Vienna and so on. Uh, he was sentenced for, for 10 years of jail. Uh, because of corruption, because he helped to, to sell the Croatian oil company to the Hungarians. Uh, on the other hand, the same week, uh, uh, the most important, it was the most important politician in Croatia, this is the Minister of Economy, also landed up in prison because he killed several people in an accident in Hungary. But this is all, of course, the bad news. The good news is Jacques Chirac last year was sentenced to two years prison. Of course, he didn't end up in prison. Uh, the good news is uh, Christian Wolf, the German president, uh, resigned because of corruption. The good news is uh, all these European, uh, European firms were, were involved in corruption in Croatia. And to finally end, at, at the end, I would like to transform this joke, which is not really a joke. Uh, the bad news is the European Union is in a big political and economical crisis, as we know, with corruption affairs erupting almost on a daily basis and unemployment rates rising as well. But the good news is Croatia is joining the European Union. <laughs> what does it mean? I mentioned, uh, and it was uh, by purpose, I mentioned the Nobel Peace Prize. As we can see, on the one hand, the Nobel Peace Prize should now serve as the main legitimation of the European Union as a Habermasian project which really succeeded uh, to be a, a, let's say, transnational project without wars, without borders, without national conflicts and so on. Although we can see that we still have borders in Cyprus, they are building a wall between Greece and Turkey, uh, they are not letting Romania in in the Schengen zone and they are deporting uh, Roma people from France, which is still happening uh, with Hollande, which is not in the mainstream media. Uh, and on the other hand, we have this new legitimation of the European Union and this is the interest of Croatia. Actually, several weeks ago I read uh, in a Croatian weekly uh, that together with the, Europe, with the leaders of the European Union, Croatia for next year is preparing a big celebration on the main square <coughs> in Zagreb where they intend to invite all the leaders of the European Union, 27 of them, and actually, after the Nobel Prize, this should be the biggest new legitimacy of the European Union. So to end, uh, doesn't all of this resemble to the anecdote from Bucharest and also to the picture we can see beside us? Uh, to conclude, I think uh, the destiny of the European Union as we see today is exactly Costa Concordia unless we succeed to change the project, to bring to a new democratic Europe, but of not only staying on the level of Habermas, but going a step further and asking the real political, economical questions we didn't have time to ask now. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Shastu, and I'm sure there are uh, questions, so I'll pass it on. Uh, and there are microphones everywhere, uh, every couple of seats, you can turn them on. So, questions, please. Uh, 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 yes. Uh, yes, we'll save the last one. <laughs> interesting that you mentioned infrastructure because I think that was the first experiment in the whole economic thing. And, and I want to add something pessimistic as well in, your, in the whole thing about something Pacha said when she was asked why all the reforms she's making are economic reforms. She said, well, economic is the method, the objective is to change the soul. There is another thing uh, Tatcha said, and you remember that as well. She said there is no such thing as society. And as you can see now, it's exactly the, it's happening now, because if there is no health insurance, if there is no education, you can take off. Yeah. Uh, and so on, that there is really no such thing as society. There is no solidarity, there are no people who are helping each other, there is no welfare state, and I think Tatcha really succeeded in, in her plan. Yeah, thanks for the comment. Comrade, it's the most interesting uh, talk. 
Now, uh, I will refer to your uh, kind of thesis, if not kind of called for called for uh, action when you said that uh, fascism signifies the failed revolution, like Walter Benjamin said. Now, to the extent that your description of the current situation in Europe is such, right, that you are maintaining its imperial tendencies, or not tendencies, actually policies manifested, and the I mean receiving the, European, the Nobel Peace Prize, the austerity measures that is imposing, the corruption of the bankers, and so forth and so on. Are we not, in this case, uh, uh, perhaps, uh, could you not be uh, accused of fetishizing European Union as if it wouldn't do that? I mean, it's a capitalist organization founded on Maastricht criteria. So to the extent that, I mean, because it, uh, uh, so to the extent that you, Perhaps maintaining your argument that another Europe is possible, you know, staying in this new one. Couldn't we say that? Uh, I would ask you whether or not to subscribe to Slavoj Žižek's thesis when he says that uh, exiting the European Union, as is the Communist Party of Greece's position, will in fact uh, give rise to nationalism and so forth and so on. Because why am I asking that? Whether or not you are subscribing to that position? Because uh, at least. Uh, in Greece, there is an alternative, and it's very, very, very clearly put forward by the Communist Party there. It's like exit European Union, nationalize, uh, nationalize private wealth, central planning, and so forth and so on. So I was wondering whether or not you don't see that as delight, uh, you know, at the end of the tunnel, you know, and not another thing coming. Thank you. Thanks for the question, really. Uh, when I said, uh, when I quoted Benjamin, of course, we could po put the quote also differently as Tariq did when I asked him this question. He said actually uh, that fascism wasn't uh, a result of a failed revolution, but it was a result of a successful revolution, the Bolshevik Revolution. Uh, but what I wanted to say with this quote is that uh, I'm really scared uh, that if there is no coalition among the left, as we can see there are coalitions among the, among, among the right, uh, there is no future for all Europe at all. At this point, I'm not so scared about, as I have been now during the lecture, about nationalist tendencies. And I really believe another Europe is possible, and we have to stick not to the European Union, but to the idea of Europe. Uh, what I want to say, if you exit the European Union, and it is happening now in Greece, uh, some friends who are close to Tsipras told me that uh, the Chinese and the Russians approach to Tsipras already to offer deals if he exits the European Union. So my, my fear is, if some countries in the European Union really exit the European Union, what would you have? Already now, the Chinese bought the biggest port, Pire, in Greece. What they did after they bought the, the biggest uh, port one of the biggest now, uh, still, in, in most important and strategically in Europe, is they crashed completely the trade unions, the wages sank, and so on. And so in one continent, as one of the workers, I think, I think you can find uh, a reportage in The Guardian said, in one country you have China, in one country you have Greece. And the same is happening in Africa, like two or three months ago, you had protests against Chinese managers in Zambia. And what they, what they claim is actually, if you have this trend without a real pol political, economical strategy of exiting the European Union, what will happen in, is a boomerang, either with the Russian capital or with the Chinese capital, or what is happening now in, in Croatia before the Minister of Finance of Economy was jailed. Just, uh, it was announced when he was coming back from Qatar on the plane that he will be jailed. All the people, important people, uh, president, prime minister, ministers, and 50, uh, 50 capitalists went to Qatar to search for Qatar capital. So what is happening with Europe is, there is another question just to conclude, is actually that the neoliberal policies are on the one hand producing nationalist tendencies, and on the one hand, they are actually ruining their idea of the European Union. Because I don't know how smart it is to, le to leave over a one important port to China and completely strain the geostrategical situation of the European Union. I don't know if, I, if you're satisfied with the answer, but we can talk later and take some other answers. Yeah.
it, it seems to me that uh, the answer is unconvincing in the sense that the options that we have are either the European Union somehow reformed or vulture capitalism. That's essentially what you're saying. And it's a dilemma we're left with. And I think this is an, anti an unsatisfactory answer for the radical movement. Now, I don't think leaving the European Union is, as it is proposed now in Greece, is providing the answers either. But I think that your answer is also still unconvincing. We need a strategy of what will happen because either option are unacceptable to us. So we need to find something much more specific when we did what we say another Europe is possible. <coughs> but I think this is unconvincing to people because Europe has already destroyed itself as an idea. Unless it's completely, completely radicalized from, you know, and I, what are the social forces? It's all right to call for another Europe is possible. What are the social forces, political and economic forces, that will lead to this other Europe? I don't see them. Okay, I must say that I see them, because I'm involved in them. And maybe you don't know about that, but uh, next year in July, uh, a very big Alter Summit will happen in Greece. And uh, just one month ago, a very important activist meeting uh, happened in Florence, called Firenze Temple Stem, uh, which was happening during the... And I agree with you, to say another world is possible, as they said in the World Social Forum, is not enough anymore. But what happened in Florence was at the 10th anniversary of the World Social Forum, they held a very important meeting for the future of the European Union. It's not just the usual suspects, frequent flyer activists and so on. There were trade unions, one of the most important trade unions of public services in Europe with more than 10 million members. Uh, Tsipras was there, other people were there. And if you really ask me what, what is the strength for Europe, then you, have, you can look to Front de Gauche in France, you can look to some other trade unions, you can look to the general strikes. Of course, I would agree with you, this is still not enough. But actually there is an answer and it is happening as we speak. I would ask you, what is your answer? If you dismiss both the alternatives, to change the Europe from inside or to exit the Europe. And it's not a rhetorical question. <laughs> Um, can I probably answer that? Um, so far, you have been talking about reforming the European Union. Um, there is the possibility of exiting the European Union. You have not mentioned the possibility for countries like Italy. I don't want to mention the others because I think it's slightly you know, unfair, particularly when you put up a proposal that is not very popular. But now we have been talking about this country deserving what they're going for. Um, for example, talking about Italy. There has been 20 years of the ineffectual government of the left together with the right. There have been 20 years of corruption. There have been uh, over 20 years of assault on the res publica, which has become res privata, which means that uh, the richness of the state have become private richness. Um, this is a cultural issue. Um, Leonardo Sciascia said in the late 70s uh, that the south of Italy would southernize the north. What is happening is the Mediterranean countries as a whole have created within the European Union a system of corruption in which in one way or the other the north has participated more and less directly or indirectly. I'm just coming now from uh, a series of travels across Denmark, Holland, Sweden, and uh, uh, Norway. And the situation is very, very different. So why can't we ask, what is the problem that has led our countries into this situation? And talking about Italy is a problem when you look at the south of Italy, where there is a university, where the father is teaching in the university in the department as head of department. The wife is there, the son is there, the second son is there, and the daughter is there. Then there is the boyfriend of the son, the, <laughs> the, the, the girlfriend of the son, the wife of the second son, and the husband of the daughter. Uh, this is violence. This is violent to all the others that through meritocracy should have taken those posts. They should have enriched the country. The country. 
um, this is not an issue of the European Union for me. This is a behavioral and cultural issue that has been unable to adapt to the global challenges, right or wrong that they are, of the 21st century, putting up a different sort of proposal. Okay, just to make it clear, you said that the southern Mediterranean countries are corrupting the western European countries. Uh, no, I'm not, saying, I'm not that. saying that they're corrupting the Western, but certainly have produced within the European Union a system of corruption. Yes, I'm saying that. In which okay. the Northern okay. has participated. Racist. Okay. You're okay. racist. You're uh, racist. You're racist. <laughs> now, you're racist. Legal, 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 Listen. Everybody's entitled to the argument. Yes, even racists are entitled to their views, yes? Okay, Lafranco is definitely not a racist. I know him very well. And, 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 you know. Okay, I will will, will try to answer. First of all, I did did mention Italy. It was in the pigs, as you know. It's a peripheric country. But when you say it's a cultural issue, I wouldn't agree. I, I would first say it's an economical and political issue. And there you have one of your compatriots who is called, and you probably know him because he's also, he's also very active in the art world, Franco Berardi Vico. Uh, when I recently talked to him, I think it was three months ago, uh, he told me uh, the bigger problem than Berlusconi is Mario Monti. Mario Monti is most, let me please answer until the end. Mario Monti is more dangerous than Berlusconi. If you follow uh, your prime minister, you could have seen in the last uh, months he said uh, there is no future for the young people, uh, which was something until now ev- no politician would say. He said this openly. He said you have to get used to different jobs because to have one job for the whole life is very monotonous. So what I explain in notice more. Let me let me answer to the end because he said something uh, with uh, where you provoked this reaction. Uh, Mediterranean countries corrupting Europe. I don't know if you followed my speech. As I said, Jacques Chirac, Christian Wolff, all the others, the Greek politicians couldn't be corrupted if the Germans uh, wasn't selling the submarines to the Greeks, which they don't really need, you know? And if you come to this, uh, to this mythology of the, of the Mediterranean, of the Mediterranean, of the South, of course, we come also to the myth of the lazy Greeks. But as you probably know, let me finish. Recently, the statistics show that Greeks work 53 percent more than the Germans. Of course, you can say they're and they're working and they're not doing anything and they're lazy during working. But the statistics show that. So I think it's a mythology. Maria Todorova in imaginary Balkans also already deconstructed, and I'm sorry, Spivak is not here, uh, because Maria Todorova was also equal to Edward Said. This is the story that the Balkans, that the South, that the Italy, that Greeks, are people who are only capable of being lazy, of making wars, of raping, and so on. Then we have a tradition of corruption. It is a fantasy. Yeah, but it exists in the European Union as well. Hold on one second, hold on one second. It is a tradition. Things would have not happened if we did not have corrupt politicians and corrupt representations within the European Union. So we have to look back and we have to say, why as Italy, and I'm just going to be talking about Italy, we have been unable to have a political class that has been able to defend our interests. Instead, they have been going there to protect their own hierarchical interests for the 1%, putting at danger today the 99% of the population, because the situation in Italy is not very much different from the way in which Greece is going. So, what is happening to us, okay? And this is probably what we should be looking back. We should probably be asking, okay, if we are expressing this political class, we have to wonder if our system is working. If the cultural, and it is a cultural issue, because mafia is a cultural issue. We can discuss this. No, it's an economical issue. It, it, it is a cultural issue. Because you have they, mafia everywhere in the world. They don't, they, they're not called mafia, you know? You have I a know, Russian oligarchy, you have a China, I'm talking, about, I'm talking about Italy and how mafia formed in Italy. It was a cultural response to the invasions that the South was having. That has left a legacy. That has left a way of seeing the state as an enemy. 
When you live, for example, in a country, you're talking with people that live, uh, let's say, let's leave Germany aside, but let's talk about Britain, let's talk about Norway. People identify with the state. In Italy, nobody identifies with the state. I see the state as an Italian, as an enemy. And how is it possible to live within a society where, or so-called society, where you see a state as an enemy and where to be intelligent, it means to rob the state, where we for 20 years, the past 20 years, we have put publicly forward the fact that to steal from the state was to be astute, was to be intelligent, was to be successful. Berlusconi, his orgy, his approval, and etc., his conflicts with media and society and private corporations is just 